Good afternoon and welcome to the five revolutions examining defense innovation in the Indo-Pacific region. My name is Fred Kemp. I'm president and CEO of the Atlantic Council. Today, the Scowcroft Center's Forward Defense Practice Area is launching a new report by Tate Nurkin, exploring the dimensions of military competition in the Indo-Pacific region, uh, which as you can imagine is incredibly timely. Uh, the report offers an excellent framework for this upcoming conversation on the technologies and also the capabilities that will shape the future of competition in the Indo-Pacific. This report would not be possible without the support of our partners, Tala. So thanks very much for making this possible. Uh, I'm, welcome to, uh, I'm, I'm pleased to welcome a variety of distinguished voices to our conversation today. Atlantic Council Board Directors Alan Pellegrini and General James Cartwright will help to frame this important discussion. They'll be followed by a panel consisting of the report author and forward defense non-resident uh, senior fellow, Tate Nurkin, as well as defense technology experts, John Gravat, Rukmani Gupta, and, Clem and Clementine Starling, moderated by Defense News's David Larder. Uh, I'd like to thank these uh, speakers in advance for joining us and, uh, and thank everyone in our audience virtually. We've been at this since mid-March. We've done well more than 550 events with participants around the world of one, more than 1.7 million people. What we've learned is we don't really believe in the notion of, uh, of, 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 of uh, social distances. You need to keep it on, on the street. You need to take care of yourselves. We believe that there is geographic distance, but we have bridged the social, the intellectual, and the, uh, and the collaborative distance all year long. And we bring brought together great groups as we've done today and will continue to do so. I can't imagine a better group for this kind of uh, audience being brought together in any other format. In accordance with the uh, legacy of former National Security Advisor General Brent Scowcroft, it is the mission of the Scowcroft Center at the Atlantic Council to develop sustainable nonpartisan strategies to address the most important security challenges of our day, uh, but not just of our day, but those that face us and confront us well into the future. The Scowcroft Center's forward defense practice is designed to shape the debate around the greatest military challenges facing the United States and its allies, while creating forward-looking assessments of the trends, of the technologies, and of the concepts that will define the future of warfare. So this is designed and should be cutting edge stuff and forward looking stuff. I couldn't think of an assessment that better achieves this goal than Forward Defense's Five Revolutions Report. As the report concludes, and as our speakers will discuss today, the Indo-Pacific is a key center of gravity of emerging defense technologies and capabilities. So it's not just a geopolitical space of great importance, it's also a place uh, where one can watch the defense technologies and capabilities unfold in real time. By evaluating military innovation through this regional lens, the United States and its Indo-Pacific allies and partners can determine which defense technology investments will prove essential to the future conduct of war. It is therefore imperative for US analysts and policymakers to understand these evolving trends in this most prominent theater of great power competition in the hopes of maintaining, maintaining a favorable uh, balance of power moving forward. Uh, before we dive into the panel discussion, I'm going to turn uh, the virtual stage over to Atlantic Council Board Director Alan Pellegrini. Alan is the CEO of Talus North America and has been an invaluable partner in this project and others. Alan, thank you for your partnership, for your friendship, I've enjoyed our great many discussions on so many different issues. We look forward to more conversations like this one in the future. Before I turn it to Alan, I want to remind everyone that this event is public and on the record. We encourage our audience on Zoom to ask questions of the panelists using the Q&A tab, which you can find at the bottom of your screen. We'll be collecting these questions 
and then answer some of them at the end of the event. We also encourage our audience to join the discussion on Twitter using the hashtag forward defense. So hashtag forward defense. Once again, uh, I thank you all for being with us. Alan, over to you. Great, thanks uh, Fred, appreciate it. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, you know, on, on behalf of Talis, I, I, I'm really pleased to be here today and, and have a, an opportunity to offer a few opening remarks to uh, help uh, kick off this report. So the topic, examining defense innovations in Indo-Pacific region, um, you know, we at TALIS certainly see as evolving as a result of really three significant forces that are shaping global security today. The first, of course, is China's ascendancy and determination to become a world military power. The second, a counterforce of regional players, including Australia, India, Japan, and others, who are investing to maintain balance against this strengthening threat. And third, the agility and speed in developing new defense capabilities, which is facilitated by the ongoing technology revolution taking place. And this is allowing these nations in the Indo-Pacific region more self-reliance from a defense perspective. The company I represent, Talis, uh, of course, is a European based uh, company, but we've long been a global uh, defense leader with uh, strong ties and commitments to the Indo-Pacific region. And we've been engaged in initiatives driven specifically by the dynamics that Fred introduced today. Uh, for example, in Australia, where we are a significant uh, partner to their Department of Defense, we see Australia's strategy and force structure aligning against the China ambition which is made very real by the expectation that soon half of the world's submarine fleet will be operating in the Indo-Pacific region. As a result, Australia is stepping up collaboration with Japan, India, Indonesia, and increasing investments in new weapons and deterrents, which are based on artificial intelligence, autonomous systems, hypersonics, directed energy, uh, all the technologies that we've been referring to in order to be less dependent on other Western powers in their own nation's defense. So with those remarks, uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, turn the stage over to General James uh, Cartwright, who will offer his keynote remarks. Thanks again. Thank you, Alan uh, and Fred for both supporting this effort and, and uh, setting up for this uh, video and venue by which to have this discussion. Uh, these are critical discussions. And um, I've spent most of my adult career life uh, in the force development uh, business. And generally in force development in the military, we look for the stressing scenario. That is the venue by which uh, we would build our forces, build our capacity, build our capabilities um, uh, against that scenario. And today, clearly, um, the Indo-PACOM theater uh, in a no warning scenario involving China rises to the top of the challenges. Um, it challenges us in so many different ways, it has uh, for so many years. Uh, when you look at the Indo-Pacific, uh, you see a vast seascape, you see channeled mountain ranges, western deserts, challenging seasonal issues of typhoons and, and cold winters and, um, and limited mobility uh, on the sea and on the land. And you also see dense population centers and extended strategic lines of communication and uh, strategic choke points that dominate that theater and dominate the um, ability to uh, create a force that can be effective at those strategic distances. So one of the questions that we have looked at in this uh, report is, so what's new for force development? What are the new challenges? What's different than, than what's always been there? And quite frankly, um, peer level regional fires, um, regional in size, uh, peer level and capability and capacity, um, and domain fires, uh, not just the air, land, sea, but, but getting into the virtuals of uh, space and, and uh, cyber and, and, uh, and 
and trying to understand how that is going to play out and what the implications of those fires are. And then uh, a country that has built regional basing and stepping stones to enable maneuver throughout the, the region. Um, a new one that um, I think probably has probably been underplayed, but we would certainly worry about a, a great deal is uh, the ability of that peer competitor to create strategic surprise, to operate inside of our uh, OODA loop, so to speak, and to create force closure constructs that, that defy our ability to close and change the course of events, especially in no warning scenarios. Um, peer level technical innovation, that's really the focus of Tate Nurkin's report, The Five Revolutions. Um, their ability to create um, capabilities, not just mimic, but take them and move further ahead and to surprise us uh, on the battlefield. These are all major concerns uh, of this theater, of this challenge that, uh, that we face today. Um, in trying to understand what our opportunities are and how we might want to think about uh, the changing security framework in the Pacific and what the implications are for force development, I think right at the very top is the role of our allies. Without the allies, uh, we, we would be incredibly challenged to operate in this theater. And not in the, in the conventional sense that we've had in the past of, We'll build it, we'll be, do the hard stuff. You just kind of layer on and give us some more scale and, and a maneuver space in the Pacific. The allies are leading the charge here. Um, we're gonna have to work with them. Uh, constructs like the five eyes and whatnot are probably insufficient for what we need to be able to do in working with intellectual property from each other and protecting that property, but using the advantages that we can get and the technologies um, as we move forward. These are some of our best allies for so many years, but we've got to bring them up to a level that um, allows us to harness those things that would counter the scale and the depth and the range of this threat. Um, second is a tech base that, that, that is spread broader than just the US that goes to our allies, that thinks about our European allies and industry and, and brings those pieces together in a coherent way to allow us to find advantage, not only before a conflict, but during a conflict in a, in a very accelerated rate. Uh, increased resilience as we look at the long supply lines, as we look at the long communication lines, and their criticality in, in these new age war capabilities, how we build resilience into those communications and transit lines and our logistics is absolutely essential. Um, capabilities that counter mass and maneuver in all domains, across all domains, is really the hallmark of where the department has tried to move and is trying to move uh, as we go forward into the future with an eye on this scenario. Um, another one is what we would call combat load, but it is the idea that every physical entity out there, whether it's a platform or a person, can only carry so many bullets. And if the number of those bullets is insufficient to address the, con the conflict, then leaving for days to go rearm and come back is just not a reasonable approach to the problem. We have to find a way to bring up um, combat load, whether it's through virtual fires or it's through different technologies that are being built, but combat load is absolutely essential. Integrated domain fires and maneuver, not scheduled, not sequenced, not deconflicted, but integrated, integrated across allies, the US, across the types of fires, platforms, domains, air, land, sea, space, cyber, um, those are essential um, to be effective in this domain. Uh, and last, um, you know, we are happy and, uh, and, and enjoy uh, long acronyms and whatnot, but command and control, command control and all of the other letters you want to put behind C2 um, is essential here. And the command and control that we have today is a command and control we have inherited uh, down through the years. We are working hard to change that, but in, in most of our conflicts, we dealt with thousands of targets, thousands of shooters, okay? Today, it's really more in the giga 
area, not just thousands, but billions. When you look at what you can do with virtual fires and virtual fires have and are mass and we have to treat them as having and being able to be employed as mass and maneuver, but billions of targets now, the capability to sustain those kinds of fires and control those types of fires, our command and control suites, both for ourselves and our allies need vast improvement. Um, I'll leave that happy note um, and, uh, and, and look forward to, to convening a fantastic panel here of experts to discuss the developments, trends, and technologies shaping this regional environment. And before I hand over the, the, uh, to the moderator, David Lardner, uh, Naval Warfare Reporter at Defense News, we'll watch a short video giving you a brief understanding of the report behind today's conversation. Hi, my name is Tate Nurkin. I'm a non-resident senior fellow with Forward Defense at the Atlantic Council and the primary author of the Five Revolutions Report. I think this report fills a little bit of a gap uh, in terms of providing a framework for analysts and decision makers first to capture, but then also to monitor and ultimately assess the relevance and importance of a variety and diversity of investments in emerging technologies by defense and security communities across the Indo-Pacific. Evaluating the impacts of all of these defense innovation efforts based on the technologies themselves can be uh, incomplete, but also overwhelming for analysts and decision makers. And so to my mind, a more constructive and efficient approach is to focus this instead on the military effects that these countries are trying to achieve through investments in emerging technologies. And militaries across the region are investing in these technologies largely to engineer step changes or revolutions in five broad capability areas. First, perception, processing, and cognition. States are leveraging novel technologies such as artificial intelligence, smart sensors, unmanned systems to be able to collect more, more frequent and more accurate information, ultimately providing more perfect situational awareness to strategic, operational, and tactical decision makers. Second, human and machine performance. Indo-Pacific militaries are investing in technologies to optimize the performance of machines and people. More protection and survivability, more speed, more strength, more maneuverability, more connectivity, better capacity to, to process information. And all of these traits are critical to the future of decision making and war fighting. Third, manufacturing, supply chain, and logistics. New manufacturing techniques such as 3D printing and digital manufacturing and cloud manufacturing and logistics processes are increasingly disrupting established industry dynamics and enabling further and more rapid defense innovation in the future. Fourth, communication, navigation, targeting, and strike. Innovations in operational capabilities and concepts such as hypersonic weapons and exotic missile systems or loitering munitions are disrupting traditional deterrence paradigms in the Indo-Pacific. It can change the pace and conduct of conflict in the region. The fifth revolution is in cyber and information operations. These operations have become increasingly weaponized to disrupt societies and governments, especially in a variety of gray zone contingencies. Allies and adversaries across the region are reimagining the way that conflict will be conducted in the future, both on the battlefield and beyond. To meet these 21st century security challenges, the United States and its Indo-Pacific allies and partners will need to invest intelligently and collaboratively in innovative and emerging defense technologies, all while considering the most impactful effects that will be essential to future defense strategies and national resilience. Investment, Innovative thinking in areas like training and organizational structure and collaboration with allies and industry will be essential to standing up valuable military capabilities in the future. Well, a very good afternoon from Washington, D.C. I'm David Larder. I'm the Naval Warfare Reporter for Defense News, and I'm grateful to be able to have the opportunity to moderate uh, this distinguished panel uh, and to discuss some of the emerging technologies that are making an impact in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, I want to quickly introduce the panel here, and uh, then I'll sort of move on and, and 
begin sort of just asking Tate a few questions about the, the excellent report that he's authored. So uh, first of all, there's uh, Tate Nurkin, and he's the author of the Five Revolutions Report, a non-resident senior fellow with Forward Defense at the Atlantic Council. Uh, and he's also the founder of OTH Intelligence Group. Uh, Rukmani Gupta is a senior military capital, uh, capabilities analyst uh, for the Asia Pacific at Jane's. Uh, and has focused much of her research on Chinese military capabilities, foreign policy, and domestic politics. And uh, John Gravat is a journalist and an analyst uh, covering the Asia Pacific uh, defense industrial base, uh, defense markets, uh, and related issues. He's an associate director uh, for the Asia Pacific at Jane's. And so I want to thank all of you for uh, joining the discussion here. Um, we are going to launch into the discussion, but we want to uh, absolutely encourage audience participation. Uh, you can use the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen, uh, and we'll get to as many as we possibly can. You can also join the discussion on Twitter, uh, and you can use the hashtag uh, Forward Defense. And uh, some of you may know Twitter is my favorite medium, and I want to apologize off the top of uh, the bat here to all you who are subjected to my ramblings regularly. So um, if uh, I do want to address one thing real quick, uh, Clementine Starling, who was introduced at the beginning, she had a uh, pressing engagement elsewhere, uh, so she will not be able to uh, join us today. So uh, without further ado, let's kind of get to the panel. Uh, uh, Tate, I, I do want to start with you, uh, and if you wouldn't mind walking us through the framework uh, of the five revolutions, and to follow up on that, you really focused on the quad, as uh, as the sort of main area, uh, main countries involved and in, in, or main countries sort of in the focus of your report. If you could give the audience an overview of what the quad means uh, and discuss a little bit about the framework uh, in which you sort of piece together this report, uh, I think that'd be really helpful. So over to you. Great, thanks, David. And, uh, you know, I think the video did a, a good job of laying out at a high level what the revolutions are. I, you know, a little bit of background. I started um, thinking about this probably seven or eight years ago when I first started really delving into why, how fourth IR technologies were shaping the future of military capabilities. And I started tracking all of these different technology areas. Initially, it was a handful, maybe five or six, but very quickly, the list of technologies that militaries were interested in uh, and that were being developed, not just within defense uh, industrial bases or within organic defense industrial bases, um, but also in applied research, academia, commercial sectors, it, it became overwhelming. I mean, the list of technologies expanded uh, the 15 to 20, and now it's probably even more than that. So, so the impetus of all this was just saying, all right, um, I, I sort of get the what, I, I get that the, all these technologies are important, um, but maybe a more useful framework, and certainly one that is, uh, allows for me to be more productive and less stressed, is uh, to, to look not just at the inputs in terms of technology, but pr primarily at the outputs in terms of the effects that militaries were trying to achieve through innovation efforts or defense technology efforts. And so that's where all this came from. And, and as soon as I started looking at it from that angle, it became clear that across the globe and certainly in the Indo-Pacific, militaries were really consistently trying to engineer these uh, uh, new capabilities in these five areas that we, we discussed. Um, originally, by the way, it was four. I think we've refined the framework over the last couple of years to more fully incorporate cyber and information operations because they've just become uh, such a central part of, of military operations and frankly, more broadly national security uh, that they need their own uh, discussion. So, uh, so that's kind of the background on it. You know, I think, well, with any framework, there are caveats. And I'm sure people watching the video sort of saw as we highlight in the paper that there are capability areas that stretch across these five that there may be not clean seams between each of these um, and, and that's I think inherent in any framework that you produce so uh, electronic warfare for example might fit in the first one around perception processing and cognition it's certainly uh, uh, platform uh, protection uh, EW fits in the second one and, and, and EW in my mind predominantly fits in, in the fourth one but, uh, but I think even with those caveats aside, I think this has been a useful way to think about how militaries in the Indo-Pacific, particularly China, but also as we get into the quad, are really thinking about defense innovation. Um, one note on China, we'll talk about a, a lot about China here today. I mean, a lot of ink has been spilled, including by me, 
on what China is doing with its military modernization and where its technology priorities lie. We touch all of that in the paper. I mean, it's important um, to, to reference it, but what we really wanted to do was explore what other countries in the region were doing. So China is sort of a driver and we talk about information dominance. We talk about uh, uh, missiles, the hypersonic missiles, anti-ship missiles. We talk about intelligentization of warfare, but we really delve into what the other countries in the region are doing. And as you mentioned, mainly the Quad, um, and that's in part because of the volume of information available on those countries, um, but also because there seems to be this reinvigoration of the Quad, of the sort of collaborative uh, approach between India, Australia, Japan, and the United States, which has gone beyond sort of the, the traditional talk shops that had happened in the past. And now there are uh, real exercises and agreements on defense uh, technology collaboration that I think uh, could be influential in shaping the future of innovation in the region. Um, and the last thing I'd say about the, about the report, and then um, turn it back over to you, uh, is that we, we didn't just look at China, although that is the primary driver, um, or, or traditional force-on-force -force conflict. We really tried to stress the need to think about uh, defense technology a little bit more broadly and to look at you know, gray zone situations in particular. Um, and how technologies could help detect those first and foremost, uh, but then uh, devise very novel, flexible responses to those types of situations. So, uh, so I guess that's the, the, the high level uh, five minute summary of uh, what the report sought to do and, and where we uh, place our emphasis. Sure, I, I'm wondering as you looked in, you know, across the quad and across the region, did you notice any nuances in terms of what areas uh, certain countries are focusing more on uh, and to a greater or lesser degree? And if, if so, could you sort of bring out some of those that you that you discovered? Yeah, I, I mean, yes and no. Uh, there certainly are nuances and differences between the countries, and some of that is based on threat perception. Um, you know, China is at the center of the of the threat perception for Australia and for Japan, for sure. It has become more so over the summer in India, but India has other uh, very big issues, which I'm sure Ramani and John and I will all have a chance to talk about. Um, so, so yeah, so there's a difference in threat perception. There's a difference in sort of uh, primary concerns. For example, uh, Australia is really appears to be very concerned about the erosion of strategic geography and its strategic distance. So no warning threats, which General Cartwright referenced, that, that features prominently in Australia's defense um, uh, update, strategic update and force posture, the, the need to really counter and deter uh, long range precision strike that can get to Australia very, very quickly and under sea threats. Um, so there are some of those types of, of, of differences, but I would say that you know, consistently across the region, there is a real uh, emphasis and growing emphasis on uh, cyber, on space, on the electromagnetic spectrum. All three of these are, we reference in the document as new domains. Clearly they're not new, they're more, uh, more attention is being focused on them, but they're called out in all of these different documents. And, and by the way, part of the reason we also focus on the quad was because both Japan and Australia released pretty comprehensive strategy documents over the course of 2020. So there was very fresh information there. Um, yeah, space, uh, quantum ensured uh, 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 precision navigation and timing, uh, remote undersea surveillance, all of these things keep popping up uh, across the different statements that these militaries are making. So yes, there are some subtleties and nuances here. Um, and I would say that India is probably a little further behind in its efforts to leverage these technologies. Uh, but the technologies themselves that are of, of interest and also the effects seem to be pretty consistent. I, I'm really interested, you know, the, the, as a defense reporter, you know, you get, uh, I, you, you talk to people that have been in the business for a long time and, and there's a good degree of cynicism about anything that's new. Uh, and, uh, you know, some things will pan out and some things won't. And, and uh, so I, I guess I, I want to kind of open this one up to the panel uh, writ, writ large and, you know, obviously Tate, feel free to answer, but Rahmani and John, I'd love to hear from you. You know, as you look at, at the region, do you, can you read any sort of tea leaves as to, um, places where they think some of these technologies will are, are really leading and, and will come about faster than others. And, and I want to clarify just a little bit. So you discuss uh, additive manufacturing, you discuss artificial intelligence, quantum computing, space and counter uh, space technologies. Uh, and I think it's, you know, it's safe to say that, you know, some of those will fulfill their promise sooner than others. Some may never. 
Uh, and then as you kind of look at the investments that people are making, including China, do you get any any sense of the bets that are panning out sooner? Uh, and and any sense of um, you know uh, of pacing in terms of the different you know technologies and, and places that stick out to you? Does that make sense? <laughs> Well, I can try and address some of what you talked about, uh, David. I think the technologies that we can definitely see panning out will be communications network. So China has supposedly already launched a 6G satellite. It is investing in a 6G network. This is also something that is in focus in countries like South Korea, for instance. And while Samsung, for instance, has already said that it expects to commercialize 6G networks or um, technologies over the next 10 to 15 years. And coming online of this kind of technology essentially means that the latency in communications will be nearly uh, sort of done away with. So you could have actual real life control over systems, this would be a boost for, for example, human machine interfaces in the future. This, this would be an, of immense value, not just for the military, but for other aspects of human life as well, whether it is medical services or whether it is governance issues, whether it is other aspects of national security. So I think this investment into communication networks is certainly something that we will see bearing fruit in the next 10 to 15 years. And part and parcel of this is the investment that China has made into its satellite networks, into the Pedo system. So when we talk about all of these new technologies and we talk about their military applications, it is actually not just one technology or two technologies. It is at a confluence of all of these various technologies, which is AI. Uh, China, for instance, has had um, registered more than 30,000 AI patents in 2019. And it is estimated that half of these were to do with image recognition. So why do you need image recognition? You need it for machine learning. How can machine learning then be scaled to support military operations or civil operations? So I think it is communications networks, but it is also a whole lot of other things, whether it is robotics, whether it is AI, which is going to see the maximum investment as far as these technologies we're, con we're discussing are concerned. And also I think um, it's worth bearing in mind this aspect that Faith had actually mentioned um, that there has been a lag of sorts in how different countries have adopted these new technologies. And a key uh, reason for this is simply the kind of investment in R&D that is being made across the region. And I'm sure maybe John can throw more light on this, but if you look at the differential between India and China, for instance, China spends almost, I think it was 496 billion US dollars a year uh, in R&D, whereas India is spending about 50 billion. So there is a 10 time differential between what China is investing in and what other countries in the region may be investing in as well. Yeah, and, and from my perspective, I mean, you, David, you asked about some of the kind of near-term capabilities that, that, that are kind of reachable, and, and, and I just point to unmanned systems. I think that we've seen um, unmanned systems across the region, really, kind of looking to leverage some of the capabilities that Rukmani was talking about there in terms of communications and naviga navigation and, and indeed artificial intelligence. And we've seen that investment over some time. That, that investment is, is well structured and well consolidated um, in terms of unmanned systems across the region and particularly in China. Um, and that, that investment is aimed at achieving a number of kind of capability themes, reconnaissance, anti-access area denial, um, search and rescue, all, kind, all manner of different kind of capabilities are looking to be achieved through the investment in unmanned systems, whether that be aerial vehicles or whether it's sub, uh, surface or subsurface. So that is an area which is being, um, which is a, a near term kind of uh, a, a capable capability that's, that's achievable for, for these countries and especially China. Um, and something that we're seeing right now being introduced 
across the region, even in terms of the swarm capabilities, which are leveraging, leveraging things like AI. Um, China has, has, has shown uh, in the last couple of years, certainly um, uh, demonstrations of unmanned aerial vehicles and surface vehicles in swarm, um, swarm uh, configurations that suggest that this is quite a near-term capability that we're likely to see um, in China's efforts to really um, uh, provide a persistent capability in the East and South China Seas uh, and a persistent profile, which of course um, upholds its claims to regional territory. So there are important capabilities on manned systems, but ones that we're seeing right now being introduced. I, I would agree with, with all of that. I mean, those are spot on. Um, you know, unmanned systems is one of these technologies that um, applies across basically at least at least three of these revolutions that we talk about. And again, it gets at uh, you can make these technological progresses, but what what is it that you actually want these systems to do? And and and, and I think I would add to the list that Ramani and John had put together. I would add a couple of other items. I mean, hypersonic missiles are of uh, of real interest to every one of the actors that we've talked about so far. Australia, the program is not quite the same as elsewhere because I think there's a sense that if the U.S. develops these weapons that they may they may become available. But um, but regardless, I mean, India has had a successful uh, technology de demonstrator just in the last few weeks of a, of a hypersonic uh, missile. Uh, obviously, China's program has moved far and fast down this road. Japan has uh, has put a lot more meat to the bone of its hypersonic missile development program as well. So these are, these are again, weapon systems, whether they're hypersonics or just very fast, very long range uh, missiles that are having a real impact on um, the investments of other, of other states in the region. And I would actually, just to give you an idea of kind of the diversity, because I think you can talk a lot about space. Uh, Thailand has, uh, has a, a military ISR satellite uh, as of a few weeks ago. Um, but I would say directed energy uh, is a really interesting one because, again, it was prioritized by, by many of the militaries that we looked at, uh, and again, for a number of different um, purposes. And we've actually seen reports of, unconfirmed and even denied uh, by India, that, that China had used a microwave weapon in its border um, clash just, uh, just uh, uh, back in September to, uh, to take two strategic hilltops. So you really are starting to see these technologies get to a point where and even though they're not fully deployed, they are of real interest and um, we're seeing real progress being made in their development. I think on this point about the report about the microwave technology being deployed on the border, I think they, this is something you mentioned in your report, which, which is information warfare, right? And how um, this is being effectively utilized by countries to dissuade conflict in certain senses. So it is misinformation as a deterrent. So while China had there have been reports in the Chinese media that there was uh, a microwave technology gun uh, demonstrator that had been theorized a few years ago. It has not, we haven't seen any evidence of this being um, put in, uh, in service with any part of the PLA or any part of the armed forces. We don't know about the logistical requirements of how you would um, provide energy for such a weapon in the peaks of uh, Tibet or the plateau or how effective this would be to um, in that region. So the idea that this kind of report would effectively lead the Indian population or China watchers to believe that there is a vaster gap in technological capabilities that, that might actually exist is also a sort of deterrent messaging. Um, that can be deployed or employed by various militaries. Well, I, I really appreciate sort of the, there's a lot of notes here that I kind of want to go back to, um, but, I, I, and and I'm trying to puzzle out in my head how, how best to do that. But I, I want to kind of right now, go right back to unmanned systems briefly. You know, this is an area that the US, uh, and I cover the Navy primarily, and the U.S. Navy is uh, launched down this path of unmanned surface vessels and unmanned subsurface vessels to sort of replace the uh, existing, um, well, not replace, but uh, augment uh, the, the, the sort of the idea that if, if I can get an unmanned subsurface vessel 
um, or excuse me, an unmanned uh, submarine to, to go do a, a mission that an expensive Virginia class submarine could do, uh, but is kind of a sub optimization of the platform if you could get a smaller, cheaper platform to do it. Um, you know, they've, they've been pursuing this path, but it's been years now of sort of fits and starts. Uh, there are sort of real physics issues with communicating underwater. Um, and the same thing exists on the surface uh, where you have, um, where you have line of sight issues. So unless you're connected with a satellite, uh, you have issues of line of sight. You can only communicate to the horizon um, uh, on surface ships. And, you know, just generally speaking, when we talk about how such a system of unmanned systems would work, it really is heavily dependent on networks and networking. And it would be very diff, and it is very difficult to set up a reliable network, especially if we consider space to be highly contested a reliable network on the surface that is sort of the, the precursor, if you will, to, a, um, to an advanced network of unmanned systems, subsurface, surface, and aerial. So I'm wondering if anybody has any thoughts on that, you know, what, what are some ways that, that people are getting after that? And, and how it, would 6G uh, networks be more secure and more reliable and more relevant to the say something as expansive as the maritime domain than 5G, which requires a lot of nodes and a, you know radios that are close together and uh, bandwidth that only travels but so far. I, I'm wondering how these emerging technologies make these systems more relevant to something like the maritime domain. And I think everyone kind of recognizes, given the expanse of the Pacific, that it, that it is in fact a, a maritime domain. David, I'll start, and I would say that um, China is very aware of the requirement to support these unmanned systems through a robust kind of navigational and, and, and communication network. Um, and we've seen the launch in the last couple of recently of satellites, the, 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 the system of satellites that is, innate, that is intended specifically to enable that kind of enhanced uh, communication across 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 its unmanned systems and we've seen indeed with the swarming demonstrations that have already taken place that this has been utilized that these communications have been utilized and been proved so 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 I would say that China is very aware it is investing in that capability to support those unmanned systems um, and and at the moment the, the trajectory suggests that that, that that it's on track to kind of achieve these 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 targets um, and, and and some of them uh, one that I, I I recall is the D three thousand, which China has developed recently, which is like an unmanned combat combat vessel, which is designed basically either as a standalone kind of combat vessel or work, working in swarms or working in tandem with manned vessels, uh, and this is a kind of a, 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 an indication I think of the kinds of capabilities that are very flexible have a lot of utility uh, and are supported by that huge investment that China's been making in satellite communications, which we are seeing right now. I, one of my questions is how reliable, in a combat scenario, how reliable can, would space be? Uh, if we're talking about uh, you know, major powers all contesting space, how reliable is space as a domain to to uh, to to operate this vast network of systems. You know, it's interesting that the chief of naval operations uh, often says that this network is is everything, right? It's the the Manhattan Project. It's uh, if you don't, uh, he says, I have network systems, I have network weapons, I have network aircraft, but I have no network. Um, how do you solve that? I mean, how do I, and and is space the answer, or, or are you going to need a a, a a more comprehensive network of networks? I think it's probably the latter, but I think your question gets at one of the really interesting dynamics that came out in, in the research, which is just the, you know, this isn't, uh, you invest in a capability and you win the competition and you go and pat yourself on the back and game done. I mean, there is a real iterative and very intense competition taking place in terms of the investments being made in these technologies, which then enable new capabilities to secure uh, C4 ISR uh, networks. and. So while you can, uh, you know, there, there are all sorts of uh, new counter space 
capabilities that are some are more subtle than others. Um, so then there's an investment in quantum secured communications, right? Quantum satellites, right? So that 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 is something that both Japan and and Australia really do focus on is the need for quantum uh, assured uh, PNT, but also comms. Um, there are new concepts of operation, so disaggregation, these sort of um, uh, micro uh, satellites that that offer some resilience. So I think um, the answer is it will be competitive. I don't know if it will be 100% secure and it will be dependent on maybe the timing and the operational environment and the objectives that are that countries are trying to achieve. But I think the United States and its allies and partners across the region should assume that uh, there will be an enormously vigorous effort to degrade and deny uh, cyber space in the EM spectrum. And that, that, uh, that it's probably the first priority is to secure those domains through a number of different measures, technology, operational concepts, et cetera. I have a question from the audience that I kind of want to get to because I think it informs some of the um, uh, other things that we're talking about. If somebody could take a stab at uh, just explaining 5G, I mean, I and 6G. So if somebody could just sort of explain what you mean uh, when you're discussing those terms. I think there is no um, common understanding of what 6G means, which is why the Chinese claim that they had launched a 6G satellite was so contested. But the idea is that 6G will be to 5G what 5G was to 4G, which is 100 times faster than 5G, which we haven't really seen. But that is the premise that companies seem to be working on. Okay. Um, so... It, you know, China is investing in a lot of um, in a lot of these technologies, and I think uh, Ramani and and uh, and Tate and and Johnny Vall done a great job sort of highlighting that. I, I think one of the things that I kind of struggle with is they are also investing a lot in very traditional stuff as well. You know, stealth fighters, uh, lots of warships. We're looking in, at at a almost fully modernized uh, PLAN. It, in the mid early 2030s, right? Looking at 425 ship Navy. Um, you know, I guess you kind of have to get it both, right? I mean, so we're talking, I've heard people, uh, defense thinkers say, we need to take big bets on, on technology. Uh, but at some point you kind of have to address capacity as well. I mean, to, to General Cartwright's point um, on, on combat load, I mean, we need enough uh, bullets in the gun to be able to take care or uh, to address the number of targets that China will present. And by the way, all of those have uh, defensive systems and radars and uh, missiles that can shoot back. So I, I guess, you know, as you think about uh, ways that technology can address this, how, how do you sort of address both the raw capacity issues and the technology issues simultaneously without going bankrupt? Or can you? David, I'll start if I may. I, 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 I would say that um, China has made obviously a lot of gains in terms of more conventional systems, um, but I don't think that the high sophistication of perhaps the US um, military systems is, is actually required. And I'll bring notice to, to something that Tate makes reference to in the report, which is about the ability to create mass um, and, you know, the Asia Pacific is on China's doorstep. The East and South China Seas are on China's doorstep. Um, and China's industrial complex really is now, over the last few years, be consolidated and restructured in order to bring a, bring a lot of efficiencies towards its ability to create and, and, and produce uh, a, lot of, a lot of equipment. A lot of a lot of platforms, a lot of which will be focused on the South and East China Seas, where a lot of these countries that we're talking about obviously have an interest, or all of them do. And so China's ability, really, that the real the real key about China's capability is this mass that China now is able to 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 bring to bear in in the, in the um, in the theatres in in the Asia Pacific. The idea with them, of, of course, with this equipment is that it's incrementally um, improvements and there are, but they don't, you know, a fighter, a Chinese fighter and a versus a US fighter is, is not real, not real uh, as yet a, a real 
like for like comparison. But where the benefit and where the advantages that China gets is through the mass uh, on its doorstep. And that is something that the US can't really compete with. Um, you know, and I'm sure Tate and, and Rukmani have some comments, but that I think for me is the key element of China's um, production uh, and, and, and fielding of conventional platforms. Uh, to, to the mass, particularly in the maritime domain and naval domain, it's not just the gray hull ships, right? It's the maritime militia, it's the unmanned systems, which, you know, if you're sitting on the, the deck of a, of, a, of a U.S. ship and you see a bunch of unmanned systems, um, you know, there, it may be, and some it may not, in some circumstances, be difficult to determine whether those are commercial or whether they're, you know, what their origin is and what certainly what their intent is. So, you know, I think the 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 mass and the ability to to take uh, territory, even maritime territory, uh, and create initiative uh, uh, in some of these gray zone situations is really important. And I think, um, again, using capabilities that blur the line between civil and military capabilities makes that problem even more difficult. I would also say the mass applies to missiles as well and the ability to overwhelm uh, US and allied missile defense systems. And of course, shooting down missiles is an extraordinarily expensive um, uh, task and, and, and maybe making some of these missiles at the maybe mid to lower end of China's arsenal is not nearly as expensive. So these asymmetric cost curves, I think, are a problem. And I think, you know, the U.S. defense budget um, has called that out in the past. But I, I think these are really big challenges that, uh, you know, directed energy, hyper velocity projectiles, sure that those things offer potential, but they're not there yet. Um, so it's a, there's a gap here that needs to be in terms of temporal gap uh, between when these technologies come available and what the threat is today. Yeah, you know, it's... Oh, sorry, sorry. No, I think I completely agree with what John and Tate have said, but, it, but it's also about the kind of missions the PLA seeks to undertake. Not every adversary it will meet can be deterred through the utilization of high technology. So you may not have a target that can be neutralized through, you know, cyber warfare or, or hypersonic glide vehicles and such. And also the fact that this mask this mass of the PLA, just the sheer capacity that it has, is again a deterrent to any contestation of PLA activity, especially around its periphery. So that is extremely important and that cannot be understated. Also critical to this entire discussion is, the, is just the human resources that China has. Uh, this has been actually emphasized just last month in Xi Jinping's speech to the CMC, where he said that our people need to be better trained as far as science and technology is concerned. How they are able to utilize the technology that is at their disposal needs to be improved. So at the current moment, within the PLA command structure, there is no confidence that uh, the higher echelons will actually be able to utilize the technology that the PLA has at its disposal to win the wars that it wants to win. So that mass and that capacity continues to be relevant. You know, one of the things that I often try to explain to people is that the reason, one of the reasons US Navy ships are so expensive is because they have to sail from San Diego and operate in the South China Sea for seven months and then come back. Uh, and that's a different, sort of deal than a ship that can get underway from the region, do a patrol and come back in. And obviously we have the forward deployed ships and that makes a difference. But that also seems to mitigate some of the advantages or even some, it sort of makes, since the, since the US military across the board has to play the away game, I, I'm wondering if there's, you know, the, the equipment just is gonna be more expensive, faster, cheaper, more of it is a lot harder to pull off when you have to bring it across the, the, the spaces and distance of the Pacific. So uh, as you think about that as a specific challenge, are there ways to innovate politically here? Uh, are there ways in which the quad can be used or even smaller nations uh, like the Philippines, Indonesia, uh, Malaysia for whatever, forever, whatever that effort would be worth? Uh, you know, are there ways to innovate politically that could begin to offset some of the advantages of this mass that PLA, uh, the PLA brings to the table? I, 
I think so. Yeah, I mean, I think that's why, in part, why the uh, sort of reinvigoration of the quad was so interesting and why we kind of focus so much of our energy, although not all, I, I do want to be clear, we talk about plenty of other countries in the, in the region um, because there's a lot going on. So I, I, I do think that, uh, that there are opportunities here, but again, basing, uh, which is really what you're maybe getting at, is, is tough. I mean, it's politically sensitive. We, we obviously have bases already in, in a couple of these countries, but it becomes politically sensitive and we're already running into some of these challenges where China can coerce um, or certainly would be willing to coerce uh, states like the Philippines into, into, into sort of denying those sorts of, that's kind of access. So, so I think it has to be, you know, and I'm not sure what the answer is from a political or geopolitical standpoint. I do think that there might be, again, coming back to this sort of nebulous term of technology, which uh, I don't want to say is a silver bullet, but there are some things that can be done to improve endurance and persistence, right? The unmanned or uncrewed systems you know, if you have more of them out there that can stay up longer and you don't have to have a, a great big base with a huge infrastructure to maintain those, maybe that offers you some flexibility uh, to respond quickly and some agility. So, um, and certainly uh, maintaining the U.S. subforce and as was noted earlier, you know, half the world's submarines are going to be active in, in this part of the world and in Australia and Japan. Japan just uh, uh, unveiled a new, uh, a new yeah. sub new class of stuff. So, so there are some capabilities that might allow for a more sustainable forward presence here um, that could go in hand in hand with a little bit uh, of, uh, of geopolitical <laughs> negotiations, but, but those might be tough. Yeah. You know, one of the things you, sorry, sorry, go ahead, John. Well, I was just going to say that I agree with Tate, you know, it, it, the U.S. must be careful not to underestimate the, the significant kind of strength and influence of China within the Southeast, certainly within Southeast Asia. You know, Ch China's influence in this part of the world where I am is, is, is very strong. Um, and we've seen in the last few years that countries such as the Philippines um, really would not be, um, would be strongly influenced by China but by any kind of um, US uh, push to, to, to establish any kind of basing or, or any kind of influence in that regard. Um, but also that, 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 that this is why I think some of the arguments and, and discussion that we've had over space is so important, why and how the US could perhaps utilise these newer uh, capabilities in order to bring a kind of influence and understanding and, and something, again, that Tate talks about in the report is the significance of, of surveillance and, and understanding what's going on and situational awareness about what's going on in the region using space capability. And this is something I think that the US certainly would be looking to, to, to leverage going forward in terms of what's happening in the Asia Pacific. I, I do wanna kind of get to this question before we go to the audience of uh, civil military fusion. Um, and first of all, uh, I guess I'll start with Ramani. If you could just sort of define what that discussion is. I know Tate's paper discusses it. Um, if you could define what that is, and if you could sort of walk through um, how the countries in the region view it, uh, and, and I know how the U.S. views it, they view it quite uh, suspiciously, and have even started to take actions to um, try and undermine it, uh, you know, targeting individual companies that they think threaten, um, threaten national security by their participation in this civil military fusion construct. So if, if Ramani, if you could help me out by defining that for the audience and, and a little bit along the lines of what, we, what I just asked. Sure, so I think very simply, or in the very simplest term, civil military fusion is essentially the utilization of technologies or capabilities that have been garnered through civilian research for military ends, or in fact, the confluence of a technological advancement made in the civil civilian realm um, with military advancement or military developments. One really small example of this, which I think demonstrates just at what level civil military fusion in China is, is the fact that the PLA has signed um, agreements with five civilian logistics companies that assist it until 2022 to support its logistic supplies across China. And what this means is that these civilian companies that have perhaps 
evolved or developed UAVs for delivery of packages or foodstuffs or what have you now have to transfer or the PLA now has access to the technology that has been developed by these companies. So we do see, for instance, in the last few months, we've seen quadcopters being used by the PLA to drop supplies in remote locations, perhaps along the India-China border. So civil military fusion, to my mind, is the co-option of what has been developed in the civilian realm by the military. And there is, in fact, very little um, distinction that remains between what technology is in the civilian domain and what is in the military domain. John, would you like to add to this? Yes, in, indeed. I think that the um, it's an interesting, it's a very interesting kind of um, question and subject, you know. And we've seen in China's very recently, just last month, in China's fourteenth five year plan blueprint, um, the real kind of high significance that China continues to place on uh, military civil fusion, um, and a lot of its a lot of the rhetoric in, in the blueprint is all. Is all about um, is, is all about this all, all about this integration of of industrial sectors and technology sectors and economies, really to create a, a kind of a blur between between military and civil um, sectors. But I would also say that that there are evidently kind of real barriers for China in this, um, and these barriers are being kind of being heightened really by U.S. Um, uh, actions over the last. Over the last year, really, in terms of in terms of understanding more about some of the um, kind of intentions of China, of China. Um, and those barriers, I think, are evidenced most plainly by China's kind of continuing um, inability to produce um, sufficiently powerful and sufficiently reliable propulsion systems, um, specifically aero engines, and that really is a classic. Um, military civil fusion area and China has not been successful um, and so you know I, I think the military civil fusion um, does have certain kind of strong implications and strong areas where China can be successful and certainly in four IR areas artificial intelligence and such such like but there are still big holes in this in this strategy with China um, and, and of course it, it, it remains one of China's most important strategies due to the due to the ongoing embargoes and sanctions that, that, that the US and the West have placed on on on, on China. Um, and I would say too that the rest of the region um, is following suit. You know, we've seen in Japan, in Japan's recent defense white paper, this real emphasis on introducing civilian technologies. And in Australia, we've seen um, uh, the, the emergence of new kind of um, uh, innovation hubs and technology uh, fund funding specifically focused on on leveraging these civilian technologies um, and take right rightly says in his report that some it's a, it's a it's a big area but one that, that has ramifications um, in terms of understanding and, and 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 addressing some of the threats some of the threats that we're seeing across the Asia Pacific so it's a it's a it's a fascinating subject but one that, that I'm not sure really China is able to, at, at the moment at least, uh, address all of its capability shortcomings through. I think another aspect of civil military fusion that is of concern to countries is the fact that a lot of the civilian research has been developed with um, the cooperation of scientists from other countries. So one example of this is uh, China's investment into quantum technology, communications, and what have you. So given the fact that China is uh, undertaking civilian research in quantum technologies that it is cooperating with Germany with, uh, with Oxford University, in fact, the fact that this technology may well be um, the foundation for the exploitation of uh, quantum technologies in the military realm is of concern to countries that have partnered with China for research and development. So I think this aspect of civil military fusion where one is unaware of how uh, they are in fact assisting China's military development is of grave concern to other countries. 
And this is true also when we're talking about AI, when we're talking about big data, and we're talking about machine learning. So the fact that certain apps may well be storing uh, personal information or user data on Chinese servers, and these may not come under the regulation of data protection acts elsewhere, and may in fact be feeding uh, enterprises that help the PLA develop AI systems or machine learning for their systems is of concern to countries. And this is, this is the key factor within civil military fusion. Whereas earlier it used to be about the use of civilian infrastructure or physical infrastructure in military operations, it has now led to this transfer, almost seamless transfer or insidious transfer of civilian technology into military domains without um, being explicit about this. So yeah, this is obviously a growing concern for individuals and countries that cooperate with China on technology development. Well, I'll, I'll just put one point to add to that, I think, is that despite the US's kind of, and, 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 and Marnie reminded me of it, is that despite the US's efforts really to contain the military civil fusion, what, what it's done so far really is just really the tip of the iceberg. You know, China's entanglement um, across civil, military, and pseudo kind of agencies and research institutes, its entanglement with international research in, in, in areas such as art, artificial intelligence is, is significant. And, and US efforts, I'm, I'm sure, are in the right direction if, if that's what it's looking for, but it's really the tip of the iceberg in terms of what China has already achieved over the last few years in terms of um, accessing the, the, these uh, research uh, networks in, in areas such as artificial intelligence. So um, I have uh, dozens of other questions I'd love to talk to these uh, panelists about, but I'm, I'd like to get the, as many audience questions in as possible. Um, and I'm going to start with Dan Bell. Uh, Tate, I think this one is, is directed at you. Um, can you explain the most significant Indo-Pacific regional challenge within these five revolutions and how it influences the U.S. military desire for joint integration and how to best address this challenge from a multi-domain capability perspective? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. It's a big question. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, um, when, I, when I think about what's going on in the Indo-Pacific, it, it strikes me that the, the first challenge, the one towards more perfect situational awareness, the first revolution, so that's perception, processing, and cognition. And then also uh, the fourth one and fifth one, um, the fourth one being communication, navigation, targeting, and strike, and the fifth, information operations and cyber. Those all seem to me to be, uh, well, we treat them uh, very seriously in this paper and, and talk a lot about them. So I, I think because of the um, the distances involved and, like we said, the sort of subtlety of um, you know, China's ability to leverage both civilian and military and, and achieve mass, physical mass in some circumstances, um, that and because of the importance of the information domain generally, you know, that perception processing and cognition uh, one is really, really important to me. And, and I see that um, there needs to be co uh, coordination across uh, the region with the U.S. close allies. And again, we stress the quad and there already is starting to be some of this in terms of, you know, uh, accepted standards, best practices, industry co-development uh, co within industry of some of these technologies. Um, I think that's a really big area, which, by the way, all three of the, these countries, the other you know, non-U.S. countries in the quad, make it very clear that they want to have increased self-reliance from a defense industrial base standpoint, but also to get to that point, need to have more collaboration uh, with their partners, not just the United States, but with one another. So there are opportunities there uh, to create some of these, uh, these systems that will help detect challenges quicker, help uh, process information more quickly, uh, reduce the latency of communications. I think that's all very important. And then I would also go to the last one, information operations and uh, cyber, uh, not just because of the operational component of cyber, which of course is very, very important. Um, and, you know, common standards across networks will be, will be critical in our operability. But I think also that the, the, the sort of societal resilience component of this, um, we stress that, that China has picked up its efforts in terms of expanding its discourse power, so narrative shaping. And, and we see it in Australia, we see it uh, across the region, um, you know, the ability to undermine uh, 
government responses by slowing them down or muddying the waters. These are all areas where I think a, a common approach to dealing with dis and misinformation is really, really important. And I think we're starting to see that come to fruition as well. Great. So um, Lieutenant uh, Commander uh, Matt Hippel uh, has, has a question. And I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take Matt's question and I'm going to add a question on top of it. So uh, as I believe my right is. Uh, so the, his specific question is, would pursuit of additive manufacturing for surge supply of critical defense supplies, parts, ordnance, et cetera, be practical, at least in the United States, uh, quality assurance requirements seem to be a huge barrier to employment. Now that's a great specific question. I also kind of want to layer on top of the question. Uh, it seems to also get to a larger issue with all these technologies of, of trust, uh, especially when we talk about artificial intelligence, you talk about unmanned systems. Um, you know, the Air Force was operating, uh, was operating remote control aircraft in World War II uh, and didn't really see it take off uh, to a huge extent to make a real impact on the battlefield until the war on terror. Um, and I think that was mostly cultural, right? I think it took a while to get uh, not just the technology, but also the trust. So if you could answer Matt's specific question, anyone on the panel, uh, and then also kind of get to this question of trust and, and how uh, the United States and other nations and including China are dealing with sort of uh, the cultural barriers to, uh, and not just like individual cultures, but the, the human cultural barrier of, of trusting uh, automated systems. Yeah, David, I, I'll have a just very, very, very quickly. Uh, um, you know, one of the the sort of interesting parts about focusing on the effects and the capability. Of, you know, you have a, a spectrum that runs from technology, which is an enabler, capability, which is really a conduit to to the effect that you want to achieve. Um, is to get from uh, from technology to capability. Uh, you have to develop, you have to innovate in other areas too. And culture is one, uh, you know, promotions, so organizational changes, uh, ethics and safety, uh, new, new, develop new ethical or maybe legal standards. Procurement is another huge one, which the U.S. Uh, struggles with now in a lot of ways, the DOD, how do you get some of these commercial companies more uh, online and able to appear? So I think, you know, operational concepts, of course, is massive. So I think that the need, um, certification, uh, which I would put under safety, um, you know, all of those things with all of these technologies, it is critical to think not just about, hey, what can this technology do, but what other sort of innovations do you have to create in order to, to have that effect achieved? And um, so I, that, that was something we, we didn't point out quite as prominently in this report, but we keep coming back to, you know, uh, training is another one. There are all these different areas where you really need to make um, knock on innovations that uh, to get to the capability. Sorry, I know I interrupted John, I think. So I'll turn the turn it back over to him. No, so that's fine. I was just gonna say in terms of 3D printing, it's a, it, I mean, in theory, this is a real uh, force multiplier, but I think, um, of course, with, which, which is of great interest to, to, regional, to regional countries. But what we've seen so far really is that similar to the US, it, it, it's been a, it's been a, a, um, a slow start in terms of 3D printing. I mean, we've seen Australia, China, Japan um, certainly introduce basic capability in terms of being able to produce um, uh, uh, supplies, mainly for, 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 for aircraft and, and for, naval, for naval assets. Um, but that really hasn't, um, we haven't really seen a revolution in that as yet. Um, uh, the main the main issues really are the quality of assurance issues that that have made reference to, um, and so this is an area that we know that, for instance, China has already uh, demonstrated capability to produce three D three D parts for some of its frontline air, air aircraft, frontline fighter aircraft. Um, Australia has, has evidenced the same kind of capability, but that really has yet to get beyond. Um, uh, 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 kind of first base kind of capability at the moment. Uh, the issues that the US is facing is certainly the, the, the issues that we've seen so far in the Asia Pacific as well, David. And I would argue that 100% um, right, there, there are still some hurdles to be cleared here, but, um, but I don't think any of them are currently beyond uh, being cleared, right? None of them are impossible. It just might take a little more time 
than what people had, had originally thought to get to kind of that point of use printing. But back to your question about basing and presence and all of that, imagine being able to 3D print drones right from the theater. <laughs> you don't need a big ship, you know, if you can get this, if you can scale this technology, which again is not imminent, but, it, it, but I think thinking through those concepts and what the responses might be now it, it is pretty important because I think the technical hurdles uh, aren't, aren't the ones that we're having to deal with, with, with 3D printing, really. You need to get the printer smaller and maybe more efficient, but it's other things which I think um, maybe take some time, but need but, but can be dealt with it. And, 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 and 3D printing isn't the only manufacturing technology that's really relevant to this conversation. I mean, this year, one of the most interesting announcements, and you can you can be skeptical about it for sure because there wasn't a lot of information attached to it, but the, the idea that the DOD, the Air Force, had produced this uh, next generation fighter and, and flown it in 12 months uh, using digital sort of design and manufacturing techniques is, is pretty interesting. Even if you even if you say, well, they didn't give us any details, so we don't really know what, what actually happened here, but it's still pretty impressive. And I think offers some insight into where those technologies are headed and, and the ability to rapidly reduce um, or, or, or greatly reduce the, the amount of development time that these advanced systems take and therefore able to upgrade them with emerging technologies more quickly. Uh, so Barry Vivell of uh, the Atlantic Council um, has, a, has a question. He says, uh, how do hypersonic weapons change the game? And can they, uh, can they be rendered uh, unusable by treaty or by deterrence? Well, um, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to the, to, the, to the first one. I mean, I, you know, this is obviously a pretty big debate and I think one that has gained some, uh, become um, sensitive is whether or not hypersonics are game changers or just an incremental capability. Um, I, I honestly am still uh, thinking through that problem. Um, I know that in the region, you know, the ability uh, to put these fires on, on target that quickly um, that, that's why, for example, Japan wants these. It, it's not so much to put a, well, in the case of Japan, obviously there aren't any nuclear weapons, but it's not so much strategic as it is to be able to defend its southern Southwest Islands, which are closer to China than they are to Japan. So the ability to get uh, a you know, force into, the re into a region uh, quickly. So I think that's really important in this region that's so big and there may be some subtle threats that move slowly and then all of a sudden you've got a real problem. So I, so I do think it is an important capability in the Indo-Pacific region, and, and, it, and it's changing the calculus, as we talked about earlier, of, of Australia's uh, defense investments, right? They have to now, because of this reduction in strategic ge geography, think about uh, how do you deter this challenge and, and, and what sorts of things can you do to speed up your own ability uh, to strike capacity. So yeah, I think it's a big deal. Um, I, 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 I think it predominantly at the sort of at the conventional traditional conventional levels where I've focused most of the analysis in this paper, but would welcome Rahmani and John on some of the other questions. The second part of the, the question was in, with regards to treaties. And, and, and the answer, I guess, is yes. Um, the, 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 we have already a number of kind of um, military te military technology treaties that, that are that are that are utilized and are and are, and are reasonably effective. Um, and I guess with, with hypersonics, that, that is an area that, that kind of falls into some of those existing treaties that are already in place. So, so the answer, I think, would be yes to that. Um, the, the, the problem that you have then is, is, is the, the, the scope to which um, countries may adhere to those, to those agreements. Um, and hypersonics is an area that, that the reaction time is, 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 so, um, is so small that uh, any 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 kind of um, uh, uh, breach of those agreements would uh, would um, would certainly not give any kind of time to react um, to, to any kind of attack through hypersonics. So um, w whether those treaties will be adhered to in in the true sense of it is a different matter. I do want to revisit this question, uh, partly because I, I find it fascinating. Um, the, the Chinese recently uh, demonstrated the DF-26, I believe, uh, in the South China Sea um, against maritime targets. Generally, if you read a DOD report and they say the DF-26 has the ability to hit targets at sea uh, in the unclass realm, it, it works. That's what they're saying. It, it's, it's not a theoretical thing. And so 
you know, the, the, the military has talked a lot about this kill chain and about, you know, thinking about the entire, the entirety of the kill chain uh, from target acquisition to, uh, you know, terminal homing and, and, and everything. I, I'm wondering, you know, obviously networking plays a big role in that. Um, how are countries in the region working through that idea of targeting a kill chain? Uh, rather than just, and the United States also, um, rather than just, you know, doing the, the traditional sort of uh, bullet on bullet, uh, shoot down of the missile, how do you get at the, the kill chain aspect of this? And, and uh, you know, Tate or, or Ramani or, or, or John, anyone that cares to talk about this, but I think this really does touch on a lot of the different areas of the, of the Five Revolutions report. I think it's the resilience of these communication networks that you've already spoken about, right? That if these networks in space are going to be contested, then what will be the utility of these weapon systems that these countries are investing in? And it is the security of these communications links that countries like China are, and even India, are investing in, or the ability to target these links. So your ASAT tests undertaken by China, undertaken also by India, are essentially, you know, to disrupt the entire kill chain is, is essentially a kinetic response uh, or a kinetic deterrent to end that is like preemptive action that these countries seek to take, or at least a capability to undertake such kind of action. Um, and it, the Chinese have actually about your um, remarks about the ASBM, they haven't actually said what missile it was. So it has been speculated, it may have been the DF-21D. Um, this was an area where um, naval uh, passage was restricted. So it is not as if China undertook these tests in a sort of complex war fighting scenario, but it was a fairly um, sort of staged uh, demonstration of this capability. So this may or may not prove its capabilities as far as the utility of an ASBM in a conflict scenario will be. I mean, we can't really tell what it may or may not be, but I think it's the resilience of communication, C2 networks, that is what these countries seek to uh, consolidate through technological advancement. And quantum communications that China is investing so heavily in is perhaps one aspect of this. Yeah, and, and I would say that uh, that's a, a, a great point. And um, I, I think, David, it goes to a couple of things that we've already already sort of touched on, which one, one of which was the cost curve, right? How expensive it is to shoot down a missile. Well, um, it's probably a little less expensive to, to handle, to deal with that missile before, you know, it starts going really, really fast. So either left of launch, which is complicated and has all sorts of uh, escalation of uh, implications, or just right of launch, sort of, uh, in, 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 the, in the importance of the cyber space and EM spectrum that all of these countries uh, across the region touch on. Um, and, and so this is, I think, where the competition is sort of headed. It's certainly still can blow it on bullet stuff, but, but other ways of, um, first of all, detecting that there's been a launch and then as quickly as possible, trying to, to, to jam the communications or spoof them or do whatever is necessary to make sure that that missile doesn't get to where, where it's aiming. I mean, I think those are our areas where some of these investments in cyber space and, uh, and EM spectrum are headed. Again, those are, that's not the only uh, application, but I, I would offer that it is one that uh, is, is, at, is at or near the top of the, top of the list, near the top. Got it. Um, so I, I let no man say that I am uh, biased uh, entirely against the army. I'm going to ask this question. Uh, what do you see uh, as the role of the various armies, U.S., Australian, etc., cetera, uh, in presumably an air and sea focused fight in the Indo-Pacific region? That's a good question. And, and, and one that I think that, um, that, that most countries are in agreement on, which 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 is really to 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 ensure that uh, there's a, a, a tactical response to any kind of invasion, um, and certainly in countries in Southeast Asia, 
um, not just on mainland, but in territory. Um, so that includes kind of amphibious as well, amphibious capability um, to, to ensure that there's a deterrent and, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a tactical capability that can respond to any kind of um, uh, invasion, which of course uh, has become a, a major concern um, over the last few years, given China's kind of assertiveness across 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 the region, that's the main uh, capability target, I think, through 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 use of the armies. But also the fact that none of these theaters are necessarily limited to one service. I think we are all aware of the fact that China is investing in joint operations, and no con no sphere of conflict is going to be limited, for instance, to the aerial realm or the naval realm or just the land forces. So I, I don't, I think all services remain relevant, especially as um, the areas of conflict perhaps are um, proliferate, essentially. So the regions where you can, in fact, come into conflict or contestation with either the Chinese military or other militaries could actually go well beyond just the South China Sea, so or the East China Sea for that instance. So I think the relevance of joint operations and jointness in operations cannot be underestimated. I've, uh, we're getting to the end. I think I have time for maybe one more question. Uh, Air Force Lieutenant Colonel uh, Christopher Mulder asks, uh, human beings and their decision-making and actions can be very unpredictable. How can or will advanced technology help with this challenge? And how can technology safeguard against such unpredictable behavior? And I think one of the other aspects of this is that sometimes the human interaction and human unpredictability uh, interacting with these technologies creates problems of its own, um, even if the technology doesn't help. But it, I'll uh, leave that uh, question to the floor. Well, I think there are a couple of quick responses. I know we're a little short on time, but um, uh, number one, you know, uh, better uh, understanding of the situation. So situational awareness, uh, sort of machine learning can, uh, can provide more information, uh, process it much quicker so that decisions are made uh, on a, a better uh, set of facts of what's actually happening on the ground. So that's the theory anyway, and there may be challenges to that, but I think that that will be helpful uh, to be able to discern between targets and not targets to be able to understand, um, you know, what's really happening in the moment the decision is being taken. So, so I would say that's important. Um, I, would, I would also though, stress your point, which is, you know, right now, DARPA, I think, has, has said a number of times that the biggest challenge to operational AI is that um, is sort of the black box nature of it. It just comes up with an answer in a lot of ways. And, and sometimes that answer doesn't take into account, um, you know, the, the socialization that humans have, the empathy, the, all the different things that make our, behave, our decisions somewhat unpredictable sometimes. And uh, so I would say that building that trust and building in um, the ability for AI to think more like humans while still retaining the advantages that they provide in terms of processing information and, 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 uh, and enhancing situational awareness is actually one of the things that needs to happen to make these, these systems more reliable. And that seems a little counterintuitive to make AI more like humans, but I think it means that there's a higher trust level and the information is being processed through filters that I think um, are more applicable in some cases. Well, hey, I want to thank everyone for this great discussion and for the great questions from the audience. And uh, yeah, I, 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 this has been a great, uh, a great opportunity for me. So I want to thank you all uh, for your patience with me and, and thank you for joining the discussion. Thanks, David.